Good morning. Welcome and thank you for joining us for week two of our Northern Light Health Business to Business Zoom Conference, How to Safely Return to Business. I'm Dr. Ed Gilkey, the Senior Physician Executive for Northern Light Beacon Health. I'll be your moderator for the next hour. Last week, we received excellent comments and feedback. We've taken this information into consideration for today's session. Thank you for that. As a statewide business, Northern Light Health has more than 12,000 employees. So far, we have safely screened thousands of people who came into one of our 125 locations to work, to receive care, or to visit a family member. To accomplish social distancing, we have been reconfiguring work and patient care areas, impacting many people across these locations. We are also supporting hundreds of employees who are working remotely. Just to provide a bit more perspective, Northern Light Health offers a wide array of services in addition to patient care. We have administrative and financial offices, retail pharmacies, food services, walk-in care services, and we're providing services beyond the bedside. Hopefully this background gives you insight into the issues we have been working through and how this experience may be valuable to you. Before we get started, I will read a disclosure. The coronavirus pandemic is an ongoing, continuously evolving situation. Northern Light Health encourages everyone to follow federal and state governmental guidance and mandates. Northern Light Health does not know the particulars of your situation, so the information presented today is general in nature and is based upon NLH's own experience, which may or may not apply in your specific situation and which may be revised as we learn more about the coronavirus. Accordingly, following any guidance Northern Light Health presents today in no way guarantees that you, your employees, and or your customers and clients will not contract or spread the coronavirus. In regards to employment, every situation is unique and must be reviewed on a case-by-case -case basis to ensure compliance with the law. The information presented should not be taken as legal advice and you will need to retain your own counsel to review specific questions regarding employment situations and or accommodations in your organization. So switching gears, please use the chat function to ask questions and we'll monitor that on an ongoing basis. About five minutes before our session is over, we'll launch a three question survey. I encourage you to take a moment and let us know if this information is helpful and what topics you would be interested in us focusing on in the future. So let's get to it. Our panelists today are Dr. Howard Jones, Medical Director of Northern Light Work Health. He works directly with Maine businesses to support a healthy workforce. Paul Bolin, Senior Vice President and Chief Human Resource Officer of Northern Light Health. Paul is involved in the many changing policies coming about due to COVID. And Angela Felicia, a licensed clinical social worker manager of Northern Light Acadia Healthy Life Resource Program. She will provide tips on handling employee anxiety. Dr. Jim Jarvis is back with us again this week to provide an update on testing and the latest CDC guidelines for safely managing during this pandemic. Today, we also have two special guests joining us for brief remarks as our hour winds down. President and CEO of Northern Light Health, Tim Dentry, will share some thoughts about our health system, and Senator Angus King with a few words from Washington, DC. First up is Paul Bolin. Paul, You've been working nonstop since March on making sure we can appropriately and adequately support our employees. What do businesses need to know to help people safely return to work? Hi, thanks Dr. Gilkey and uh, good morning everyone. Part of this uh, uh, pandemic and the complexities of uh, inherent with COVID-19 uh, really uh, stem back to some basic employment premises um, which the first priority is, is of course, keeping people safe. Uh, and that of course be being employees, uh, your customers and the community at large. Um, and we're seeing through, throughout um, uh, our reopening of our economy and in many business situations, um, uh, masking continues to be a primary uh, method uh, to protect uh, employees, customers, the community at large, um, as well as other social distancing techniques. Um, but not everyone can wear a mask. Uh, most people can, but there are still some circumstances that 
where it wouldn't be appropriate. Um, and, and businesses are questioning, uh, what do I do about that? Um, in addition, uh, if customers are not compliant, um, how do we handle those issues? Um, it's easier to uh, provide and, and direct employees to wear uh, masking. Uh, it's, it at times can be harder uh, for the public at large. And next slide, please. So um, part of this uh, key effort and, and the phenomenon that we see uh, and by virtue of this, of this uh, meeting itself is that uh, we're doing things differently. Um, remote work continues to be um, more prevalent than it has ever been. And some people can continue to work uh, remotely and that, and that makes a lot of sense uh, for those uh, who can do it. But there are some, some roles that simply can't be done uh, in a remote nature. Uh, direct patient care is an example of that. Uh, food service, uh, grocery stores, uh, and others uh, are examples of industries that, that simply need to have people present uh, where uh, their operations take place in order to, um, to do that, uh, that work. Uh, different workspace configurations is, uh, is certainly a, a, a nice way uh, and a helpful way, if possible, um, to avoid um, uh, contact, so giving employees at least six feet of distance between one another while masking um, is an important uh, um, workspace protection. Uh, but again, in, in some instances, uh, additional PPE might be required, such as face, face shields uh, and the like, um, as uh, uh, we understand COVID-19 to be spread through uh, airborne droplets. Um, so sneezes, coughs, uh, speaking, uh, singing, et cetera, are, all produce uh, droplets out of our mouths, uh, and, uh, and those uh, hover in the air for a brief uh, period um, following uh, um, those, uh, uh, those episodes. Um, but in, in addition to different workspace configurations, just as has been the case in the past, leaves of absence uh, could be a viable alternative for some uh, who are not able uh, for a host of reasons to, um, to mask or uh, uh, provide uh, other uh, or use other PPE. Next slide, please. So the focus really um, when considering a leave of absence is very, very similar to what it has always been. Um, you know, if an employee has a serious health condition, um, they may be entitled um, to leaves uh, under Maine uh, and federal law. Um, and so that, that could mean employees who are generally to be near others. Uh, and there are other um, situations where an employee uh, could determine that uh, a reasonable accommodation for them could be a leave of absence. Um, certainly, um, adjusting the workplace, uh, coming up with uh, different assignments, if they're operationally appropriate, um, could be uh, additional reasonable accommodations. But really, the key is to engage in a discussion um, with employees to ensure that, um, that you understand what their Concerns might be, um, and if you're not sure, um, once you learn those concerns, um, uh, can certainly consult with your attorney uh, on that specific case-by-case -case circumstance. And on the next slide uh, is just essentially identify some key phrases to be comfortable asking questions if employees are not clear. Employees generally um, don't use language such as, I'm requesting a reasonable accommodation. Quite often, uh, they might say, I need help, or uh, have other general questions and you know ask clarity uh, clarifying questions so that it's it's very clear that you and the employee both um, understand what the process would be um, if they're making a request for a reasonable accommodation um, and uh, uh, share your uh, the details of your safety plan for them make sure that they understand what you're doing to keep people safe um, masking distancing um, different workstation configurations are all examples, um, but employees want to know uh, and their family members want to know um, that they're uh, protected while at work um, uh, to continue to, uh, to be healthy and well. And that uh, answers or responds to my uh, uh, different uh, uh, topics, and we have Dr. Jones coming up next. Okay, well, thanks, Paul. And now we will hear from uh, Dr. Howard Jones. Dr. Jones will bring some clarity around when COVID becomes a work-related exposure and what the guidelines are for people coming back to work after an exposure. Dr. Jones? Hello and good morning to everyone. Uh, 
I'd like to shout out to all the people I've met before in the room, virtually speaking, and those I haven't. Um, today I'm going to talk about two topics that are fairly thick. Um, the references to these are the available to everyone to download at the end, so you don't have to really take notes, of course. The first is on uh, causality. That is to say, OSHA's guidance is recently issued regarding coronavirus for the workplace. Um, basically, OSHA has established, as is on this slide, that for uh, a coronavirus infection to be related to work, one has to have a diagnosis, and they use the CDC guidelines and criteria for that diagnosis. They stipulate that there shouldn't be any other reasonable explanation, and that there should be community transmission and occupational risk taken into consideration when deciding do you record it or don't you. The thing to remember, also written in the OSHA guidelines, is that simply having a case in a workplace does not mean OSHA is going to cite you as an employer. They're trying to find out what's the best thing to do and make sure that OSHA logs are in fact accurate and correct. The logic of risk, as we'll get to in the next topic, is really evolving constantly. And again, I'd recommend people keep an eye on the regulations and guidance from OSHA. Go to the next slide, please. Uh, basically, I decided to take the, the negative of, um, you know, reasonable explanations and say, well, here's the list of what are reasonable explanations. So, uh, Ideally, OSHA would like to see that someone has considered, and the key is to consider, uh, situations where there are several cases among employees who work in close proximity, again, with no alternate explanation, that uh, it's, the condition is contracted after exposure to a customer or coworker who is themselves confirmed COVID-19, and, and that the uh, employee have job duties, including frequent and close contact with the general public or the source person. All of these, again, uh, are things that OSHA wants you to consider when you decide, do you put it on your OSHA log or don't you? We'd switch uh, slides here. Um, it's the important things to, remind, to remember is that uh, recording a coronavirus event does not mean that you violated any OSHA standard. It may imply that you did do something wrong, but it is not taken in and of itself as that. It's important to respect privacy and medical privacy. If you have questions, and OSHA and CDC both recommend that you consult an occupational medicine specialist to help with this part. Uh, don't violate the employee's expectation of medical privacy. And of course, they expect that you'll do make some effort to investigate and not simply write off the uh, exposure as a result of a community involvement. Which brings us to the heavier topic, when is it safe for employees to return to work post-exposure? Uh, I've added a little graphic, I think it's my humorous summary of coronavirus, which is some central science surrounded by lots of interpretation of science. Um, a couple things I would like to note is in the supplemental materials that come with this, uh, we've made available our symptom checker, which is not an app in the formal sense, but simply a web page that's launchable from any device that may help you, and you may want to play with this, uh, keep track of individuals who perhaps should or should not be coming to work in any given day. It does not collect any information, and you're welcome to take a look at it and use that if you like. Basically, the issue here really is that um, there's a lack of biology information regarding the coronavirus itself, but it's assumed to behave very much like any other member of its coronavirus family. Uh, industries have different risk of transmission, as we've all heard in the news, from you know, a single person in a single store to a meatpacking plant. And of course, an occupational medicine specialist should be consulted uh, if you have any difficulties, and many places do, with deciding how do I reopen a business once there's been an exposure, or how do I bring an individual back to work? Go ahead and switch uh, slides. For an ill employee at the present time, while antibody testing is available at a limited degree, it's, it's, we don't really understand what it means. So CDC is guiding against antibody testing. Although again, you can buy it with increasing frequency, no one knows what to do with the information. And uh, polymerase chain reaction testing, PCR testing, using the swab in the nose is really considered the only valuable test. It does have limitations as everyone is familiar. Um, and we can go into those in other topics and certainly Dr. Jarvis can address them. Uh, testing and contact tracing are really the key public health strategies and the system has not caught up with the volume of need for that just yet. Although everyone's I'm sure heard about that in the news. The strategies to return to work for an employee who are ill are based on two sets of criteria, either time-based after diagnosis or test-based after diagnosis. And you could read yourself 10 days after diagnosis of first symptoms or if you're asymptomatic after a test, and with no and with three days of no uh, fever on anti-fever medications, improvement in respiratory symptoms, et cetera. Um, after positive test-based strategy is somewhat problematic because the test can remain positive even if a person no longer is infectious, we believe, for some time, even out to weeks after an initial illness or a positive test. Switch signs if, if you would. 
So how to safely return a person to work, and this really applies to everyone, even the employee who has been ill. Uh, strategies, uh, and you can see the, the uh, reference to the link, I should say, to the uh, application. Um, strategies really have to do with basic strategies for a clean environment, which is trying to uh, reduce intensity, frequency, and duration of an exposure or potential exposure. So daily symptom screening, there's lots of ways to do them. And temperature screening, you've all heard about, is sort of falling out of favor at this point. Uh, so no one really knows how accurate or useful it is. And this process does depend on people being honest. Uh, social distancing to reduce exposure intensity, cleaning surfaces regularly following CDC guidelines, and I would also add the guidelines of your equipment manufacturers are very important to consider. Uh, face coverings on everybody and controlling coughs, hand hygiene, uh, ventilation, improving fresh air exchanges, and the use of HEPA filters, particularly in central systems, as opposed to a standalone little unit in the corner, which may not do much. And keeping, obviously, ill employees and customers home and vaccinate against other illnesses because, of course, this may become an issue, probably will again when the flu season arrives. That's why your grandmother called it golden flu season. Go ahead and switch pages, if you would. Well, thank you, Dr. Jones. Next up is Angela. There's a lot of concern on how we can help employees with all the anxiety that COVID is causing people. What are some of the things leaders can do today to support their teams, Angela? Thank you. And thanks for everyone who is joining this webinar series. We're happy to be providing this information to the community. So one of the things that I think is particularly important to think about during the course of this crisis situation um, is that we're in the midst of it. Um, there's discussion in the news, certainly whether this is first wave, second wave, et cetera. Um, I've got a colleague of mine that started calling this intra-COVID, so that we're just sort of in the midst of it. And the truth of the matter is, because this is a new situation for every single one of us, none of us alive, well, the vast majority of us anyway alive, haven't experienced a pandemic before, there's a ton of anxiety, worry, stress around this situation, all of which is extremely normal. In fact, stress, anxiety, worry is a normal part of everyday life in general. Oftentimes stress, in fact, can be good. Um, when we buy a house, start a new job, get a promotion, send a kiddo off to college, those are stressful events and yet also very positive. Stress and anxiety can protect us from harm, can keep us alert to risks and dangers, and can even allow the body to move quickly out of harm's way. The problem from all this stress and anxiety, of course, is when this anxiety becomes chronic, or when many stressors happen at the same time, or when the stressor doesn't seem to have an ending or a solution, like this global pandemic, for example. These can lead to issues in the workplace, such as absenteeism, presenteeism, right? So employees are there, but perhaps not as productive as the past and low morale. Next slide. So I do think it's valuable for employers to recognize some signs and symptoms of stress and anxiety. These signs and symptoms can really manifest themselves in the workplace. Um, some of these signs and symptoms might be very familiar to folks. Um, I myself notice that when I'm particularly stressed or anxious, I get a lot of tension in my shoulders and neck. Um, I've definitely been seeing a joke going around on social media about folks gaining the COVID-15 instead of the freshman 15. So some of those appetite changes can really be related to stress and anxiety. In the workplace, you might notice that your typically happy-go-lucky employee might be suddenly irritable or hard to get along with. You might find that your typical high-functioning employee work has suddenly gone downhill. Obviously, these could be performance issues, but it could in fact be an emotional sign of stress and anxiety. It's this predictable nature of the stress and anxiety during the pandemic that we can prepare for. We really want to look out for these signs, expect them, and acknowledge them as normal. Next slide. So kind of setting the stage and then also thinking about, well, great, what are we going to do about all of that? 
um, one of the things that we really first want to do is actually normalize this anxious response to what's happening in the world around us. So I've been in the mental health field for 20 plus years, and really anxiety is rooted in that fight or flight or freeze response. This is actually the normal hardwire response our brain has to stressors. We can really expect this. All of us humans will experience this, and we want to plan for that normal response. So one of the things we can do to plan for that is to provide objective, factual information on regular and frequent intervals. One of the things that happens to our brains is when our brains are under a great deal of anxiety or stress, our what's called executive functioning, kind of that higher logical thinking part of our brains sort of goes offline. So as much as we can provide factual information to employees, the better it's going to be for them and we'll give them an opportunity to really let some of that fight, flight, or freeze response settle down. We also want to offer employees a sense of control uh, over their environment and being able to allow them um, a way to answer, to ask questions um, and then get those answers. So, I wanted to at least sort of give a way that that might look in the workplace. Um, one of the things that we can do, particularly if you are managing folks off site and you've got people working remotely, um, holding informational meetings and asking that folks turn their cameras on can be really helpful. That gives a bit of a sense of being a bit more connected, being able to visually see folks. Setting that stage where the leader is really providing that factual information and collecting information from those employees can be really helpful. We want to offer that reassurance about physical safety and health and be really honest about that. We are all um, very much aware that the science around the coronavirus, COVID-19 is changing rapidly. So we can provide as much assurance as we have today and being pretty upfront with people about that. And then again, we really wanna gain and provide employees an opportunity to feel as if they have a bit of control. So we wanna ask for staff's help. Collect information, collect feedback, collect input, and that will help reduce employees' feelings of stress, anxiety, and being overwhelmed. So one of the things that I've got here on the slide as well is around repeat. So sometimes uh, for those leaders who are kind of in this all the time, it can feel as if we're over communicating. When people are particularly stressed or anxious or worried, it's actually not possible to over communicate. Remembering the way our brains function is that sort of higher level thinking logical goes offline when we're stressed and anxious. So providing information frequently and in many different formats is gonna be really helpful. It'll be an opportunity for folks to process information and gives people a sense of control over a situation that can feel very out of control. We do have a Q&A session toward the end and I'd be happy to answer any questions that folks have. Well, thanks Angela. Dr. Jim Jarvis is here to provide a quick update on the dynamic guidelines for testing, Jim. Thank you, Ed. Um, uh, so the, the testing guidelines change on a fairly regular basis, uh, both based on science and data and also based on our ability to do testing. I'm delighted to state that Northern Light Health and its lab has been able to expand out our testing capabilities um, and that includes being able to test more individuals. So initially we were testing those individuals who were in tier one categories. Those would be individuals who needed to be admitted to a hospital for COVID-19. Um, or healthcare workers or first responders, or those individuals living in a congregate living um, situation, such as a long-term care facility, uh, a group home, um, or a shelter. Uh, we then expanded that out to also include tier two individuals. Those would be individuals who are at significant risk for serious disease um, if developing COVID-19. Um, and we're delighted that this week we're able to add all patients who are symptomatic with symptoms suggestive of COVID-19 uh, for testing. 
that is great news for our community and our patients um, because we will able to further know what the prevalence of the disease is in our community um, and offer some reassurance to individuals that whether they have the disease or not. Uh, the state recently um, also made an announcement about expanded testing capabilities. They have entered into a contract with a company known as IDEX. Um, who will be moving an, an, a very large analyzer um, outside the state lab in Augusta to be able to do um, more rapid and, and a large number of uh, volume sampling of those PCR tests, the one that tests for active disease. Uh, that will not be up and running until probably the first week of July, so that expansion has not yet occurred. Um, in that, the governor also issued a what's called a standing order to allow individuals to get tested um, without having to go to a provider and get an order for that test. However, that is a very limited um, number. It mirrors very similar to what Northern Light is currently using for their testing criteria, meaning those individuals who are symptomatic. Um, it expands out to those individuals who have had a significant exposure um, to someone who has had um, COVID-19. Um, and then lastly, for a few uh, asymptomatic individuals under certain conditions, it is not a blanket order for anyone to get a test for any reason. And all of the major health uh, organizations around the state are still using some criteria um, to make sure that we are doing testing that will benefit us all from a clinical standpoint. And that leads me to screening and whether testing is important for screening. As Dr. Jones mentioned, Northern Light Health is happy to provide you with a web page that will have up-to-date screening questionnaire that your employees, um, vendors, and clients can utilize when entering into your facility. There was a recent study out of uh, uh, Japan for Japanese workers that had been working in China in the, in the large hotspot of Wuhan um, who returned to Japan shortly after the pandemic um, came out. They were all tested with a PCR test and screening test and the screening questionnaire. Unfortunately, neither system was very reliable, specifically when using it as a one-time thing. And the reason being is that this virus has a very long uh, incubation period between the time of being infected and the first time of showing symptoms. Also, it has a long period between the time of being infected and when the, the PCR test becomes positive. So at this time, we do not recommend routine screening of employees um, or vendors or clients uh, with a PCR test to enter into a facility. We do still recommend using a, screen, a screening questionnaire, but a one-time screening questionnaire is not good enough. It should be used on a daily basis um, when, uh, when your employees return to work um, or for anybody entering into your facility on a regular basis. And again, we're happy to provide that website that makes this a little bit easier um, for both the staff that need to fill it out and for you as the employer uh, to um, rapidly get your employees back into your work center. And with that, we'll answer questions. Well, thanks, Jim. Um, please send your questions into the chat box so we can organize that. Um, and so now we're on to the questions. Uh, we will group similar questions together so we can address as many questions as possible. The first question is for Paul. Is wearing only a shield considered a reasonable accommodation? Masking really is the key um, and the shield in and of itself um, generally would not be um, appropriate uh, PPE to, to provide adequate protection to both uh, the customers or to the employee. Um, Dr. Jarvis might add some commentary to that from a clinical perspective. Yeah, and I agree, Paul. Uh, a, a face covering and social distancing are the paramount ways to protect ourselves and others from this virus. Uh, using a face shield alone would be, an, a, would be an, a, a, more than just a going without anything, but unfortunately does not provide the level of protection that one needs to prevent, prevent the spread from respiratory droplets. What it does do is certainly protects you if you were to sneeze or if somebody was to sneeze on you, but unfortunately they do not provide that 360 degree uh, protection for air travel. And so it should be really used as a last resort um, for making accommodations. So Jim, uh, you know, we've been talking a lot about um, facial coverings and masks over the last uh, two sessions. Could you comment about eye protection in the midst of all of this as well? 
That's a great question. Um, so yes, so we know that, that respiratory viruses like influenza, the common cold, and now COVID-19 coronavirus um, can also be transmitted when, when one gets the virus into, into the eye from the same kind of droplets that happen when we talk about protecting your nose and your mouth. Um, and so that's why eye protection is important when somebody cannot be with uh, six feet away from somebody else, or if between two people, one cannot uh, wear a face mask or, um, or a face covering. And so in order to protect the other individual, eye protection uh, is necessary. You will see that in our hospitals uh, where sometimes we need to address patients and we need to uh, do a clinical examination on patients where the patient themselves cannot wear a face covering. And when that happens, we do require that our staff where both face covering, in our case, a, a medical grade face mask, as well as some form of eye protection. We strongly recommend those be face shields so that they cover not only the eyes, but the rest of the face. Uh, but if that's not available, then, then goggles would be uh, um, an, a suitable alternative. Well, thanks, Jim. Dr. Jones, this next question is for you. There's a, a lot of conflicting information out there regarding facial coverings, uh, non-surgical masks when out in public. How do we, as an employer, provide accurate scientific information to employees regarding this? Well, uh, it's a good question. Um, obviously, as I'd mentioned, the science is evolving sort of constantly. And a lot of this is uh, probably science tempered by availability of materials, frankly. Um, resources such as uh, Northern Lights uh, returning to business uh, web pages we have in these webinars probably serve as one of the um, one of the few sources where we try and bring everything together to make information available to employers. Uh, CDC obviously has information also, and it really is uh, tricky providing um, up-to-date and non-conflicting information to employees and regular communication uh, are probably the most important ways to handle this, frankly. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Jones. Angela, the next question is for you. Recognizing that you want to bring the human element to uh, managing the employee's anxiety, is it useful to share the employer's anxiety when speaking with employees about their anxieties? Hey, Dr. Gilkey, that's actually a really good question. Sometimes as leaders, we can uh, want to project a, a uh, we want to project strength and confidence, which is important. However, we also want to be realistic too and recognize that this is an ever evolving situation where we're learning um, new information, science is evolving. So we also want to be realistic um, and it's okay in fact to share some of those concerns that leaders or employers have with their employees, um, showing a bit of vulnerability in that way actually can be pretty helpful for employees. It can set the stage and sort of allow employees the chance and even really feel as if you're giving kind of unspoken permission for employees to also express some anxiety and worry. You know, certainly um, having said all that, making sure that, you know, you don't use your employees as um, your major source of sounding board, but being able to be a little bit vulnerable with employees can actually be really helpful. It gives that sense that we're sort of all in this together. Thanks, Angela. So Paul, the next question is for you. Um, from a small business perspective, are written policies recommended uh, for all things COVID? Written policies are helpful, um, but really an outline of what you expect um, is, is really the key um, to what a policy is telling employees so that they have clarity and, and understand what you expect from them. For example, um, if, you, if you go around the community to, to various, uh, various locations, you, know, you can see that employees of some businesses either haven't adhered to or haven't been trained properly on how to use a mask, how to wear a mask. If you can see someone's nostrils, um, they're not appropriately using that PPE. Um, and so I think it's important to have clarity so employees know what you expect of them um, and what they can expect from you. And so policies in a, in a very detailed written format are fine, but also you know, for smaller employers, the key really is that you have a policy that is easy to understand for employees um, so they can easily follow it. 
Great, thanks, Paul. Dr. Jones, I actually have uh, two questions. One leads into the other. Uh, the first is, if an employee thinks they may have been socially exposed, so this isn't a, a work-related per se exposure, um, over the past week, they don't have any symptoms, should they go to work? And then building on that, could you define a little bit more for us what an exposure actually is? Uh, sure, we'll, we'll probably take the question the other way around. An exposure per CDC guidelines is basically close contact, somewhat ill-defined, but six feet is the magic number at the moment, uh, for some period of time, also ill-defined, without proper personal protection to an individual who has uh, coronavirus, which is challenging because, as has been mentioned previously, many people with coronavirus have no symptoms or minimal symptoms. But presuming ideally that I were to know that I had been exposed and did not have a proper protection, that begins the cascade of events, which should start with me contacting my personal physician to discuss what I should do and quarantining myself from others who may uh, obviously not have the virus to prevent its spread. The CDC guidelines are for a 14-day quarantine, obviously with testing becoming more available, but recognizing, as Dr. Jarvis said, the limitations of testing, uh, this becomes a little complex and is certainly a question we run into from time to time now. Great, thank you. So, Dr. Jarvis, um, I know you touched upon this today, but it, it's still quite confusing for some of us. And I, I think some of it is as our main state CDC is trying to make uh, testing much more available, um, trying to follow the guidelines is, is still remains somewhat confusing. Could you, could you just kind of review um, asymptomatic testing for us? So currently, most of the health organizations across the state, uh, there are very few uh, asymptomatic individuals that they are testing. Uh, one large category is those, uh, for us, patients who are undergoing procedures that are uh, more likely to generate those droplets in the air. We call those aerosolizing generating procedures, um, which include things like endotracheal intubation or being, having the, the breathing tube put in while you're going under general anesthesia. So that's a large number of those particular cases. Um, other times when we have been doing some uh, testing of asymptomatic individuals uh, would be that they are in close quarters with other individuals who have, who have tested positive already um, with symptoms. And the largest group that we've known that for uh, is those living in those congregate living situations, particularly nursing homes and assisted living facilities, where we've all heard about in the media where there have been outbreaks of multiple people, uh, both symptomatic and asymptomatic testing positive. The reason why it's more likely or better for us to be testing in that situation than the general population at large is we already know there has been an exposure there to the virus, and that is a, it is a significant exposure both in terms of time, the amount of time they spent with the person who is, who, um, is infectious, and in the proximity, meaning as close as they are, particularly in healthcare, um, in a long-term care facility or an assisted living facility, uh, we get very close to our patients and residents in those situations. So those are the two primary areas where we have been testing asymptomatic individuals. Beyond that, it is really kind of controversial, as both Dr. Jones and myself have already stated, as to whether or not testing asymptomatic individuals has a benefit. Um, because if the test is negative today, all that means is right now you don't have enough viral particles to make that test positive. It doesn't necessarily mean you're not infected. Similarly, having a positive test in an asymptomatic individual may simply mean that they had the virus weeks ago um, and are still shedding viral particles that we test for, but are not, not uh, contagious. And therefore, what does that value have? And so it really is tricky. I understand where the confusion is. It has been confusing for those of us who, who practice in healthcare and particularly in epidemiology on a daily basis. So no wonder that it's confusing for those of you who this is not part of your daily routine. Um, it's why we continue to recommend following expert advice looking at our uh, continued uh, increasing in our guidelines and guidance about that um, and letting us determine whether or not it is proper for someone to get a test um, versus just walking up and saying, I want a test. Thanks, Jim. I, I have another uh, testing question uh, that's been shared with us, uh, if I may, uh, for you, Jim. Uh, where can people coming into the state get tested in lieu of 14-day quarantine? 
Yeah, that's a very good question. I will first of all state that right now that order is not in effect. It does not go into effect until the 26th of June, so, so next week. Um, the order specifically states that one must have a test within 72 hours before one goes out of quarantine. And it specifically states that it is that uh, the governor uh, is intent is for you to receive that test prior to crossing the border into Maine. So with all of those caveats, what happens if you cross the border into Maine and you have not been tested? Uh, there are some uh, private locations that are doing some testing. Uh, you will have to pay for that test to be done. Um, it is unclear what the time frame would be. I will say that uh, there are some websites where one can go in and look for testing sites across Maine, and you should call before before going to one, uh, because uh, unfortunately, even some of our own testing sites have been listed as that. And currently, we do not have the capacity to test individuals simply because of travel. Um, and, and that's unfortunate. I understand that the complications that arises, but uh, we need to protect our resources to really utilize those tests uh, when clinically indicated, particularly if somebody has symptoms to know whether or not they have the disease. So, Jim, um, is Maine.gov uh, a good access port for the CDC information? Actually, uh, the phone number 211 is probably the most accurate one because that's easier for them to keep up to date. It is a live person, um, and so information can be, got, can be received there. Um, and then, uh, actually, Google has a pre pretty decent website where it also uh, can tell where testing locations are. Though, like I said, call before you show up. Great. That's very helpful. Thanks, Jim. Uh, Paul, I have a question for you, um, and um, the, the wording's a little bit challenging, but I, I'll go ahead. Uh, what enforcement steps are available uh, to employers uh, regarding facial coverings and social distancing at work? You know, not everybody is quick to comply. You know, what's some of the um, tools that can be used? So the, the key, you know, with any discipline or, or contemplated discipline, of course, is to make sure that employees know or should have known what, what's expected of them. So the first step really is training. Um, assuming you've done a good job to, to train people um, and people uh, uh, simply refuse to comply, then that would fall on your normal um, approach to how you would uh, deal with employees who are not following um, clear and specific directions. Um, many organizations, you know, would see refusing to wear uh, PPE as a safety violation, uh, which it, it certainly makes sense that it is. It puts the employees, uh, their colleagues, and, and customers in danger. So, um, but I think most employees want to be healthy. They want to be safe. Um, and in my, my first uh, recommendation would be to ensure that employees truly understand the, the expectations um, but certainly if they uh, continue to, uh, uh, to not comply, then you should follow your normal process and procedures for uh, dealing with employees who are uh, refusing to follow your policies. Great, thank you. The next question is for Angela. Angela, how can an employer best uh, recommend to an employee taking some time off if they, uh, if they recognize that the anxiety is getting the, the best of that employee? Uh, while still coming across as supportive? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's another really good question. This is a particularly stressful time for a number of reasons. Obviously, the health and safety concerns related to coronavirus, but then certainly we're in a financial recession. Schools were closed. Childcare camps are closed for the summer. There's a multitude of stressors happening right now. So this can be really, really anxiety provoking for folks. Um, so the most effective thing employers can do is to really normalize that everyone's feeling pretty anxious right now and repeatedly let your employees know what are the available resources for them. Many of our um, mental health services across the state have actually converted to telehealth. We've certainly done that at Northern Light Acadia. Um, often employers have an EAP program, which is also particularly helpful and can be of great benefit for employees. So sometimes those conversations aren't one and done. Um, sometimes there are multiple conversations with employees where you might just say to them, gosh, I'm a little bit concerned. I want to make sure you're okay. Here are the resources available to you. So you kind of continue to encourage employees to utilize those resources. Great, thanks, Angela. 
Dr. Jones, this is sort of like a scenario question uh, for you. If a customer um, who was a customer in the past few days reports being uh, test positive, what steps are needed for the business manager to take uh, because of that exposure? Well, first, I would obviously um, want to consult uh, any medical advisors you have regarding how to respond internally, and of course, your facilities folks for cleaning. Uh, it, this actually has been something reported to us. Um, we've had a couple of employers call us with this very question. Generally speaking, it was very thoughtful of the customer to have reported that, uh, trying to trace back when they were present, how long they were in the store, and uh, what individuals were present helps to find the at-risk group. And of course, at that point, a uh, good cleaning is appropriate. It's very difficult to manage the, we'll say, couple of days in between the uh, customer's visit. As far as how you communicate that to the outside world, to let other individuals know they may have been uh, exposed. Contact tracing and testing are, again, as I'd mentioned in my uh, discussion, important, but those processes haven't really begun yet. So a portion of this is a medical response, and a, a portion, frankly, is a, is a sort of public affairs response to how you deal with the fact that a uh, potentially, though not known, uh, significant exposure occurred at a public place. Managing work police members is probably more uh, more easily accomplished with you know appropriate messaging and just finding out who was working the shift and then stopping pausing to clean appropriately is appropriate and again cleaning should probably be taking place regular regularly every day it's probably happening at most locations already so that's most people understand the purposes of uh, you know cleaning high touch surfaces so so a quick follow up on that um dr jones um if someone thinks that they're, they've been exposed over the last several days um, uh, to somebody who has tested positive, you know, based on being closer and uh, closer than the social distancing or uh, a longer exposure time, and then they test negative, is it safe for them to go back to work at that point? Well, that depends on who you ask. <clears throat> As, uh, you know, D Dr. Jarvis addressed, uh, there's can be some latency between the con between the point of person contacts uh, the virus, contracts the disease, and is found to have a positive test. Uh, again, most people should be therefore wearing face covering, practicing hand hygiene, it's, it's since the intent of that is to keep me, if I were infected, to giving it to you as not infected. Uh, beyond that, they should really reach out to their personal physician for guidance and watch for signs and symptoms, as everyone should be doing, since the disease is obviously found in the population in general, uh, and it can occur inside or outside of work. Great, thank you. We have time for uh, one more question, and uh, this is for Dr. Jarvis. Um, th there's a lot of interest about uh, antibody testing and you know as you're aware it did seem like antibody testing could help us really managing going back to work could manage you know who might be safe in the environment because perhaps they've developed some immunity to uh, COVID-19 disease um, could you talk to us a little bit more about the usefulness of antibody testing and um, um, do that in about a minute if you will <laughs> Very good. So antibody testing or serologic testing, um, its utility uh, right now is limited. Um, it is limited in a few clinical situations, and its most value is actually looking at community prevalence of where the disease has been, not where the disease is now. Um, and so that makes it very challenging for who it is that we want to do that testing on. I will remind people that currently there is no FDA approved serologic testing uh, for COVID-19. It is all based on emergency use authorization. That means it has not gone through rigor rigorous trials uh, to make sure that these tests are valid. Um, and because of that, really they're, they're of limited utility outside a few research kind of clinical scenarios at this time. Great, thank you. May I have the next slide, please? So I want to draw your attention to a, a June 23rd session hosted by the Maine State Chamber of Commerce that will focus on the legalese of return to work issues. It's in your slide deck here uh, for future reference. And just a quick reminder, uh, we will launch a three question Zoom survey at 1155. So now we have the honor of welcoming Northern Light Health President and CEO, Tim Dentry. Tim? Thank you very much. 
and the picture should be coming up here in a second. It's not working, but that's okay. Can you hear me okay, though? Yes. Okay. All right. There we go. There we go. Thank you, Dr. Gilkey. And first of all, I want to thank our Northern Light experts. You know, Dr. Gilkey, Dr. Jones, Paul Bolin, uh, Dr. Jarvis, and, and Angela. And I just, just have to give a quick shout out for our Healthy Life Resource Program because that's something with our 12,000 employees across Northern Light we've really leaned into as helping all of our employees individually and as work teams. So that's been great. So I also want to acknowledge that Senator Angus King is on this call and uh, he will share some thoughts from Washington. Before that, however, uh, as a uh, relatively new leader in healthcare in Maine, uh, uh, Senator King, we haven't had a chance to meet yet, but uh, this is my fourth year here and really just absolutely love it here in Maine. I wanna thank you, Senator King, for your continued leadership and expanding so many things. Expanding broad, broadband in Maine, which is critically important to businesses, education, and healthcare in our state, and all the CARES Act support has been so critical to provide great care and keep families supported in Maine, be it within Northern Light Health or across the state and small businesses and households and communities everywhere. Senator King, you've been tenacious in helping Maine advance the reach of telehealth services. Certainly, we relied heavily on telehealth while we were all quarantining during COVID-19. And I like this, uh, the reference to we're, we're now uh, inside of that right now. It's not in the rearview mirror for sure. Northern Light Health in April, for example, hosted more than 36,000 patient visits via telehealth, and it was about 1,500 per month uh, prior to that. So it's a very important outreach uh, uh, vehicle. People told us they, they liked them. We plan to keep telehealth as something that we uh, use to connect to people in the future. So. Senator, again, you're helpful in securing funds that were so necessary to help Maine businesses and people through this trying time, including helping us in healthcare get the personal protective equipment, my goodness. Our caregivers need to be safe while doing their jobs. And for that, I say thank you. Sorry for that long-winded introduction, Senator King, but uh, we'll turn the zoom phone over to you right now. Great. Well, thank you. I, I only got there for the last part of the introduction, but I heard the word thanks, and I sure appreciate it. Uh, <laughs> About 10 times. <laughs> oh, no, that's great. Um, I'm really interested in, in asking some questions, uh, learning how, wh where, where Northern Light is. I, if you don't mind, I guess the first question would be, uh, are you back to normal in terms of elective surgery and admissions to the hospital? That's, that's number one. Yeah, that's great. Well, if my team is okay, um, I'll, I'll, I'll give that a shot. Um, you know what? Very, uh, we're, we're probably at about 90%, uh, 80 to 90%, depending on the region. You know, a little, a little slower ramp up in some places where they still have, you know, the heat is on for uh, COVID in the southern part of the state, of course. In the northern part of the state, most of the surgeries are back in action again, so we're, and we're really ramping up, but we're trying to be very, very careful with this um, because we don't want to just, you know, get into, get into infection problems and really not live up to our standard of, of safe care. So we're opening up cautiously, and as we open, we've met those, those goals. And are you seeing any uh, increase at all in COVID admissions uh, over the last, say, two or three weeks? Yeah, great question again. Um, actually, we, we've had some peaks and, and valleys, um, but for the most part, they have not peaked like they were rising very rapidly, you know, a month ago kind of thing. Um, as we speak, I believe we have nine uh, patients that are positive. Three are in Mercy Hospital, so most of our admissions have been uh, at Mercy in Portland. Um, and our home care and hospice are, are just saints. They've cared for probably 80% of our patients in that kind of a setting, including the, um, you know, the shelters and assisted living facilities and the like. So re under control at this point, Senator. So, and, and not much uh, uh, outbreak in, in Bangor, it sounds like. No, that's right. We were ready, you know, plan for the worst or, you know, hope for the best plan for the worst. And we did that and uh, we're in good shape as far as that goes. Not only a few patients have been there. 
And how about PPEs? Are you how are you in 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 regard to PPEs? PPEs, we have a rock star force. It was not easy to get to a, a great level of assurance, but we have we have a sufficient amount right now for all PPE, um, and we keep a really good scorecard, even with an eye on if there was a surge and we needed four times as much as we have right now. How many days do we have on hand? So we look at that dashboard all the time. We're in good shape. Okay, and and I I just heard that the, the tail end of your introduction it sounds like the money came in handy uh and uh, uh, yeah. that was that was uh, important i'm sure during that uh, during that period are how are you looking forward in terms of uh financial uh stability yeah um our our road to uh economic stability and recovery is solid and sound right now we believe by the beginning of our f fiscal year which is october uh we'll be in in good shape, but of course that assumes no additional outbreaks and we get back to that 100% level. But uh, what would be awesome is if the, um, if what was, you know, the, 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 fund, the care funds that we would be paying back over time, if that could be extended, that would be a huge lifesaver, that's for sure. Um, but uh, we, we believe we're in, we're in very good shape right now. But, but again, I just have to say from uh, the, you know, the 12,000 employees that we have in Northern Light Center, because of that, we were able to say to them, we're not going to have layoffs, we're not going to have furloughs and that kind of thing, which a lot of health systems have had to do across the country and also in Maine. So, you know, we, we have reassured all of our staff that, you know, their positions are secure. And that was so huge. Well, that's a, that is a huge deal in this you know, in this economy where we're hurting in other areas. How about the, the your smaller associate hospitals in the more rural areas? How are they, how are they doing? Well, I'll give you one uh, real quick example. And this is, as you know, Mayo Hospital has just joined us recently. And they had said to us that, and recently meaning less than a month before all of the social distancing and everything else, you know, be, became, you know, our, our new operating model. And they said, if we would have been um, on our own and not with Northern Light, then um, they, they aren't sure they could have kept their doors open. So I think that's one great example of how the strength of the system really um, helped make sure we were uh, accessible in all of our communities. So therefore we had all the um, swab and goes, all the drive up kinds of things. We brought to bear so, many, so much of our PPE. Some of our hospitals, Mayo said, they never had this kind of PPE accessibility in the past before. So I think we've done very, very well. And again, many thanks to you. Well, let me, uh, those are the questions that, that I had, but let me, uh, what, what do I need to know going forward? What, what thoughts we, we don't, I'll be, well, let me give you a quick update. I have no idea when or if there will be another COVID related relief bill. Uh, it's uh, right now, Senator McConnell, who controls what comes to the floor of the Senate, has sort of not been very interested in, in this, and he's talking vaguely about something in later July. Um, and that's, that's where it stands. I mean, my principal concern now is the state and our state and local governments. Uh, and by the way, that should be of concern to you as well. Uh, if the hit on the state government is, is as severe as, we, as it now appears in terms of lost revenues, uh, they have nowhere to go to make up for those revenues. A, a tax increase is not in, is not likely. Uh, therefore, they're going to have to start cutting, and a lot of the cutting is going to go right to uh, the communities. But I'm afraid Medicaid, uh, main care, might also be uh, one of the places where where they're going to have to look. I mean, they, you know, we have a balanced budget requirement in the state of Maine, and and so you should be aware that. Uh, the the travail you're not immune to the fallout from the travails of the state, uh, and I hope that your colleagues around the country will get that message to their senators. You don't need to you don't need to to uh, lobby me, but um, we really need help for the states and localities. We've got towns now that are either laying off, furloughing, 
or passing budgets with vacancies, particularly in the in the area of first responders, which is you know this is the worst time to be laying off first responders. So uh, the 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 political status now is that the House has passed a major COVID relief bill called the Heroes Act. I call it COVID four, uh, but Senator McConnell has indicated he's not interested in taking it up, and he's made noises about not being interested in helping the states. Uh, so that's that's the situation. And, and with that as background, if and when we do get to another bill, uh, what in particular, from your point of view, should I be focused upon? Yeah, thank you for asking me that question. Um, I'm honored to be having this discussion with you. I, I you know, we, we know that that is an issue. We've factored that in, that we could see anywhere from four to five percent of our net revenue. So going from the gross to net revenue because of, uh, you know, less people on, on main care and more uh, self-pay and that kind of a thing. So we've actually put that into our, our models. Um, so that, that would be uh, probably one of our biggest unknowns and biggest hits going forward for economic health. Th that's why I, I would get back to one of my earlier thoughts, and that is even just, you know, with what, what is already more than on the table, what has already, you know, been provided to us, if we can extend that payback period or make it a forgiveness or make it, you know, make it five years or something or three years, that kind of thing, that would help us absorb that kind of uh, a situation. All right. I've, I've noted the payback period. That's a, that's a good point. Um, yeah. The other piece, I just got off a hearing uh, a half hour ago with the Armed Services Committee where we had before us the general who's going to be in charge of the uh, virus, uh, I'm sorry, the vaccine uh, uh, project. Mm -hmm. And I, I think uh, I'm worried, I mean, I'm worried about trying to do it too fast and compromising safety, but I'm also worried even when we get there, how it's going to be distributed, who's going to get it, how, it's, how that decision is going to be made, who pays. Uh, and I urge you to be thinking about that because ultimately a lot of the delivery will be through our health system and, and public health, but also our, our hospitals. So, uh, you know, be thinking about whether it's going to be December, January, or next June, uh, the the whole issue of of the the we're, you know the the mechanics of getting that getting that vaccine uh, to to people throughout Maine. Yeah, thank you for pointing that out. Um, we haven't added that to our list yet, but that's that's a very good thing to keep your eye on, and uh, we have a good vehicle to do that right now, though, because through all the good things have come out of this, and one thing is that we have a very close relationship with DHHS. And a lot of my colleagues that have been on the, the call uh, uh, previous to, to you uh, joining us on this call are part of uh, task forces that we have with not only the other health systems, but with DHHS. So we'll make sure we front and center that point. That's a great point we haven't even started to talk about. Well, I just, I figured you needed something else to worry about. I didn't want you to get <laughs> complacent. Right. That's right. That's right. It's getting a little too routine. Well, Tim, any, anything in addition for me that you, you want me to focus on? I, I understand about the, the uh, stretching out of the payments. That makes a lot of sense because it was a, a, it's a two-year, I think, two-year now, and, and that's not very, very long. Uh, so we're, we'll, keep, we'll keep working on that. Yeah, that's great. Now, but before you got on, I was, I was again, thanking you for uh, all the support on telehealth, on broadband. Um, those, so those are huge things to get across the uh, the goal line. That, that you know, that's that's really a very big deal for us. That's for sure. Well, when I when I leave this call, I'm walking up to the Capitol, and one of the first things I'm going to be doing is literally introducing a bill, uh, co-sponsored by uh, Senator Todd Young, Republican of Indiana, on the expansion of telehealth. I think if there's something we've learned from this, it's how important telehealth is. And uh, it has it has enormous potential, but in order to realize it, we have to have the connections. Number one, and number two, it has to be reimbursable at a reasonable rate, uh, so that it 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 makes sense for everybody to to take advantage of that huge potential, particularly in a rural state. 
Right, and we always tell people it's it's not just um, a stopgap kind of thing during COVID because the practices were closed. It re it is essential. You're right for a rural state for outreach and um, and that's why broadband has to go hand in hand with it because doctor to doctor we're using you know showing sharing images and that kind of a thing. So it's huge for us, big deal. A, f a quick factoid: we have 1,500 uh, telehealth visits per month. Pre-COVID, we have 36,000 in the month of April and about the same amount in May. Wow, that's yeah. unbelievable. Yeah. Uh, and, and you know, I, I just think, you know, now that we've learned about how powerful it is, and I say we, I'm talking about consumers, uh, this, I think the, the future is, is going to be a, it's, it's a, it could be a great thing for improving health outcomes in, in rural Maine. Uh, and I yeah. compliment you on being able to, to manage that unbelievable uh, increase. Well, thank you very much. Senator King, we really appreciate that uh, you only had a few minutes available uh, at the end of our session here today. So we really appreciate that you shared with us. And uh, Mr. Dentry, we appreciate uh, the sharing of that 36,000 uh, two months in a row. Uh, just before Senator King goes to Capitol Hill to talk about telehealth. So perfect timing. So thank you, gentlemen. And I'd like to also thank our panelists today. And thank you to everyone who has participated and uh, stayed on board as we ran a couple minutes over. We certainly hope that you found the last hour a good use of your time and were able to identify some useful tips to apply to your business. Don't forget the three question survey uh, as you close out Zoom. We're, we're planning on offering a session every Thursday, 11 a.m. to noon uh, in the foreseeable future. Uh, we would welcome all of your ideas for content. Uh, we'll send you a link along with topics for week three. We encourage you to share the invitation with your friends, colleagues, and others who might benefit from this information. By working together, we will help Maine safely open back up for business. Thank you and have a good afternoon. Thank you, Ed. Senator thank you. King, thank you so much again. Take care. Great to, great to be with you all. Thanks so much. Thanks okay, for what thank you're doing. You. Thank you. Bye-bye.